Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, your master certified coach and midlife mentor. And once again, I'm so glad to be here with you for this week's episode, which is all about the best midlife career changes we all wish we made in our 30s. So think about that. I mean, we're going to explore the best changes to make that you know are so darn good to make now because you're older and wiser, and you probably also wish you made these changes in your 30s. You might even have a little bit of regret. And you know what? You can learn from that too. I'm going to share what I've come to know personally through my work with clients to really give you something to think about and apply to your own life if you haven't made the changes yet to your career that you want. The changes I'm going to talk about have been powerful ones to so many. And the idea isn't to beat yourself up that you didn't make these changes earlier, but I want you to really hone in and think about what you want and why, and then to allow yourself to be happier because you're connecting with that part of yourself. But first, this episode is brought to you by my private coaching program, Regret Proofing in Action, and I like to think of it as the gift you give to yourself that keeps on giving. So in the nutshell, private coaching is a great way to go if you want more help applying the concepts that I teach in the podcast. You know what I mean? So don't get me wrong. It's super fun to listen to the podcast while you're doing other things. We all do that, and I get it. It's so over-the-top fun that I call podcasts a party in your pocket. Sometimes I say party in your purse, but with the pandemic and all, we don't go too far these days. (laughs) So what I mean is that there's so much fun just waiting for you right there in your phone, which is likely with you all the time when you're doing other things. But the thing is that when you listen like this, you're not completely able to focus and apply the work to yourself like you do when you're being coached one-on-one. You know what you're doing when you listen to podcasts, lots of things like driving, walking the dog, that sort of thing, to name a few. You're not taking notes or listening 100%. And it's harder to remember some of the little life-changing gems enough to bring them to life for real. So when you get coached privately with me, you really do give yourself the gift of insight and self-care. You put yourself first. You create the space to think and reflect with the help of a master coach. So if you want to get clear about what you want and learn skills to make it easier to create what you want, that is, make midlife changes faster, private coaching with me is for you. So go ahead and apply for my personalized coaching program where we take all the things I teach here in the podcast, apply them to you personally and your actual life so you can do midlife on purpose. Book your free Get Unstuck call now at www.talktosusie.com. Okay, let's dive in. What makes you happy at work? What makes you happier at work? Do you think you're too old to strive to be happier at work now at your age? Do you even know what you think about this? (laughs) Have you ever been happy at work? When I think back to my early work experiences, I see a lot of clues and it's kind of fun to do this. So here's what I mean. My first job was at 15 at a cheese and sausage type of store in the local mall. I got to wear a cute Swiss dress and stand in the mall hall (laughs) offering samples. Hi, would you like to try a sample? That sort of thing. I looked adorable. And I met a cute guy who also worked there who thought I was amazing and smart. I made $3 an hour. The boyfriend got a 15 cent raise and he lobbied for me to get a raise too. I think it was like um, 1979 or 80. And I loved this job because it was close enough for me to get there and back by myself riding my bike, a Schwinn racer bike. (laughs) And of course, I love cheese. So location cheese, and a boy made me happy at work. Now, my next job was as a hostess at a diner. My uniform was super ugly, and I asked people if they wanted smoking or non-smoking when they walked through the doors. I didn't like that job because of this uniform, remind me of like a burlap bag, 
and being exposed to smoke. So fresh air and decent uniform would have made me happy at work, which I did not have. And then I had a job for a while selling knives at another store in the mall. I actually loved learning about knives, kitchen knives, folding knives, Swiss Army knives. I love my manager. She was super smart and I could get myself there easily. Like I said, the Schwinn bike. <laughs> so what I liked was learning, sharing my knowledge, having a smart manager and location that I could manage on my own. Then one summer, I had a really different kind of job. I was part of a groundskeeping team that looked after an industrial park. I would sweep up the parking lots, wash windows, pull weeds, that sort of thing. And I loved getting a tan and being part of a team. I didn't love the physical labor though. And I remember one time I was so tired that I took my garbage and weed bucket with me into a nearby cornfield so I could sit on it while I took a 15 minute nap. <laughs> I hid. I actually hid in the cornfield. Wow, right? I just, it's kind of embarrassing to share that. <laughs> So anyway, then when I went to university, I was a resident life advisor or a don in my dorm for a few years, which I loved. Again, being part of a team was great. I liked the status of being in a leadership position. I didn't like the two in the morning rounds, though, um, dealing with drunk and unruly students. That I didn't like, but I really liked being part of a team. From there, my jobs became more academic in nature. I was a psychology student and I got related jobs as a teaching assistant and a research assistant with professors, you know, that sort of thing, until my first professional job in health education and health promotion after grad school. Now, one of those professional jobs was downtown. And I have to say, like, I live in kind of the suburbs of Toronto and this job was downtown. And when I was in my 20s, I thought it was kind of cool and definitely fun to go from the north end of the city downtown where the big buildings were, right? <laughs> I don't feel that way anymore after 19 years of commuting and rush hour traffic, though, I got to say. But what I really loved about these jobs, the professional jobs, was problem solving, working on something important, like something that could make a bigger impact, and focusing on behavior change. I loved being with really bright, cause-oriented people who had strong values. And there was always a bonus point when I got a manager who was visionary and had excellent leadership skills. Bonus points for that, right? <laughs> so there you go. This is a fun little exercise that I encourage you to have fun with it too. Um, just do a little walk down your job-related memory lane and see what you can learn. So I can see some of the ways that I enjoyed work more than others when I take a look. So what I liked was proximity of the workplace to my home, working with smart visionary leaders, working with skilled managers, problem solving, working with people, learning new things, working in a cause-oriented capacity, focusing on behavior change. And here are the ways that I noticed that I enjoyed work less. Commuting for an hour each way, lack of flexibility during the day, especially with family issues with kids, right, or aging parents, or even pet issues, um, not enough vacation time and flexibility in general, reporting to difficult or what I perceived as weak leaders and managers, and not working directly with people. Now, when I was working all of these years, I don't think I was aware of this sort of thing. I was more focused on the job, the salary, the fit with my education, benefits. I wasn't aware of the importance of the softer aspects of work so to speak, especially flexibility. Another thing I certainly wasn't aware of was my thoughts about each of these work elements. And as you can see, some of these issues are directly related to the job. Some are tangentially related to the actual job. It's a little different. Just another thing to look at, but it's really important to remember that what you make each of these things mean, the, these elements mean, is critical to how you feel. And that will be the thing that ultimately creates your results. So even though it feels like it's the job or the thing itself, like the commute, for example, it's not. It's what you make that commute mean, like that it's a waste of your valuable time or that you could be doing something way better with that time of day. You see what I mean? Not everyone feels the same way about a commute. And I have to say that even my opinion changed a bit once satellite radio came out. It was a lot more fun since that technology happened for me in the car and the commute started to bother me a little bit less. 
But overall, I didn't like it. And again, not everybody thinks this way. So as we've talked about so far, there are things that you can more easily put your finger on that are bugging you or that bugged you about your career in the past. And then there's what you think about them. Those actual thoughts are what create your emotional reality, which will be the reason you end up doing or not doing things after that. So those thoughts that are up there in your brain are the reason that you have personal outcomes in your life and in your job. And this is good news because if you ultimately decide to work on how you feel about these things, the commute, the manager, the the, uh, job title, because if you decide to work on them because it's not the time to change your career path or your job, you can totally do that too. But if you're ready to make a change, you'll also need to understand if your current thoughts are useful to you as well, right? You're going to have to really figure that out. You're going to need to make sure that your specific thoughts and mindset in general are creating feelings for you that actually help you, like what I like to call, lean in to your goal to make a change. I'll put a link in the show notes about a very specific blog that I've written to walk you through this so that you can check that out as well. It'll be in the show notes. Okay, with that said, let's take a closer look. Here are the eight best career-related changes you probably wish you would have made earlier, like in your 30s. So number one, less of a commute. Now, the reason I put this one first is because it's something that so many are reflecting on now because it's become so common to work from home with the pandemic. It's tangential to the career change itself, but a key part of the decision. So are you someone who is now working from home who wasn't before? I know not everyone likes it for a variety of reasons, but many people do because it can eliminate the need to commute and can typically save you one to two hours a day. I don't know about you, but I kind of like the idea of saving two hours a day or 10 hours a week. If you work 48 weeks a year, that's a savings of 480 hours a year or 20 full days a year, ish, of course. It's all ish, (laughs) but it's a big savings of time. So ask yourself, has commuting been a part of your life and what do you think about it? Okay, number two, becoming self-employed. Have you always wanted your own business? More and more women are giving being self-employed a try, either on the side as a jobby or going all in or both. In fact, there's a new word for starting a job on the side. I just learned it. So it's starting a job on the side while keeping your full-time job. And it's called sidepreneurship. And it's a growing trend with women. The 2019 State of Women-Owned Business Report said that the growth rate of sidepreneurship for women between 2014 and 2019 has been far greater than for all women-owned businesses. So it's 39% versus 21%. And the reasons for this are things like ease, low risk for testing out an idea while you're working, right? Wanting more flexibility and wanting more autonomy, that kind of thing. So interesting. So what do you think about becoming self-employed? Is it something you've fantasized about? It totally was for me. And I've talked about my Needlepoint store epiphany in other episodes. And I'll put a link in, uh, to episode 139 called Five Ways to Use Envy for Good in Midlife. So you can check that out. Okay, number three, employers' values aren't in alignment with mine. Now in midlife, When you're working with a company and the corporate values aren't in alignment with yours, it can really cause a problem for you, but you're often conflicted about leaving because of your age and all the age-related things. So when you age, you start to become more aware and have a greater commitment to your values. And when there's a disconnect with your, your employer, you can really feel frustrated. Now, interestingly, in a recent study by LinkedIn about workplace culture trends, 86% of millennials said that they would consider decreasing their income to get a better fit where values are concerned. They would consider decreasing their income. Now, this is for sure a reason for career change that you probably wished you made in your 30s or at least got used to making. 
but it seems harder. I hear this from clients all the time. It's harder to leave a good income at this age. So do you feel out of sync with the values where you work? Like a disconnect? It's totally a reason that women decide to make a career change and often wish they'd done it sooner. All right, number four, better people factor for you. So yes, the people factor. It's common not to be clear about what you really want and how you work best career-wise when you get older. You would think you would know this by now, right? You're older and wiser. (laughs) But alas, you don't always know. I really think it's important to dig. And this is a big reason that people come to me for coaching. One of the things you may not really understand is the people factor and being clear about what you really want. Do you want to work alone? Do you prefer being part of a team? And is that what you have now? If not, why not? It's really good to check in with yourself on this one. All right, number five, this one's about curiosity, more curiosity welcomed. So ask yourself, does your current job allow you to be curious? Is it celebrated or do you get the hairy eyeball because of the way you handle yourself and your projects with curiosity, with questions? My guess is that one of the reasons you're listening to this podcast is because you're curious. You can't be as happy as possible if you don't get this right. How is this whole topic landing for you? Number six, feel challenged and less stagnant. Feeling stagnant is one of the most common ways that people describe what the problem is when they come to me for coaching. And what usually happens is that at the beginning of a new job, you learn all kinds of new things. But when you've been at that job for some time, like many of us have, your experience just isn't the same. In my first few professional jobs, my focus was on tobacco use prevention. I dove in, I learned so many new things, I participated in research projects, I did conference presentations, and I was definitely feeling challenged. But then a couple of decades went by and I didn't feel as challenged. Conference opportunities dried up and time marched on. It was kind of like marching in place. And if you were also in marching band, you know exactly what that means. Working and playing hard, but going nowhere. (laughs) There's often more fear involved with making a change because of feeling stagnant. It can feel indulgent if you don't know exactly what you want to do. So do you feel stagnant professionally? When's the last time you felt like you were fulfilled because of your professional growth? Really think about it. Okay. Number seven, learning new things and going back to school. Now, this change is related to the one we just talked about with feeling stagnant. It's about learning new things because you're studying and learning new things on purpose. So you become a learner again. And when in this role, it can be uncomfortable because you're not used to being the one in the room who isn't the expert, right? You're now a beginner when you're learning something new. You don't have the competency that you're used to having. Again, taking courses and going back to school is often seen as an easier path to take in your 30s than later in midlife for just so many reasons. So what are your thoughts about becoming a learner again for your career in midlife? And number eight, changing jobs more often. Now, this is a common way to feel about your career in midlife. Many women our age were informally taught that longevity was the way to go. Get your seniority, get your perks for a long-term employment, like accruing more vacation time, for example. Get those payment increases, get that vacation time. You know what I mean? Get those perks. (laughs) And when your job changes more often, you learn more and you're exposed to more skills, more opportunities, more people. You practice taking risks and you put yourself in a position to grow. When you're focused on longevity, you're not necessarily getting those perks. We were valuing the other perks, but we were missing out on these perks. And there are so many good reasons to do this, to make job changes, but everyone's favorite emotion gets in the way often, and that is fear. I remember watching a friend and colleague of mine change jobs internally pretty regularly in my last long-term job, and I wasn't doing the same. I never applied for a secondment. She did. Maybe two. I never applied for a lateral move. She did. Again, maybe two. I just stayed put 
through reorg after reorg and carried on. I remember being a little confused and maybe even a little befuddled about why she was so darn motivated to keep doing this again and again. But I wasn't. I just wasn't interested. But now I see what was really going on. Fear again. I was actually fearful of change, fearful of rejection. Apparently, she was not. So what are you thinking about a career change for yourself? Really think about it. Be honest with yourself. Anyway, there you have it. The eight best career changes you probably wish you would have made earlier, like in your 30s. So what can you do with this information, you might be wondering? What can I do next? Well, if you made a change because of one or more of these, that's amazing. And you can use this information to continue to explore why your decisions were so in line with being authentic to your true self and doing some pretty solid regret proofing. This is a key reason why people have regrets later on. So well done. By continuing to explore your actions, you can also honor your courage to put yourself first. Now, what if you haven't yet made a career change that you know you really want? Well, my friend, you have to drill down and decide what you want and why you want it. Life is short. You know it. I know it. And at your age, you start to be pretty sensitive about aging and running out of time. Very common. So ask yourself, why are you hesitating? Really seek to understand this. Pay attention to the way you answer this. Check in with yourself to see if you like your reasons for not making a change. When I did this myself, I realized how fearful I was. And you can tell it's come up several times already in today's episode. And when I dug in and explored, I realized I didn't like my reasons. I didn't want fear calling the shots in my life, but I was so unaware that's what was happening. So the bottom line is that if you wished you'd made these kinds of career changes in your 30s, you can absolutely still do them now. It's a great way to regret proof your life. So ask yourself this. What if you challenged the way you thought about this being a good time to make a change? What if you totally believed that now is the best time for you to do this? What if you believed there is plenty of time? Thoughts are optional, my friend. You can think what you want on purpose. It is all up to you. Okay, that's it for today's episode. My focus as a midlife coach is to help you waste less time spinning and feeling stuck. It's time to get excited about your life again. Remember, being the queen of your brain domain really is the best way to be. Check out the show notes with more information and links at susierosenstein.com. Download my free guide, Nine Secrets to Get Unstuck in Your 50s at susierosenstein.com forward slash nine secrets. And if you're tired of feeling stuck and doing thought work like this alone, then you are ready to finally put yourself first, I think. I got the memo. You can become a first lady when you join me in the Finally First Club. Now, Finally First is my monthly midlife coaching program where I teach lessons, help you apply the concepts in your life, and I'm available to mentor and coach you along the way. It's a fun and comfortable way to get clarity and focus for your next chapter. And I'm also there to answer your questions. And just like the whales that I adore, take a deep dive into your thought work so that you can finally get unstuck and move forward even now at your age. So get on the VIP wait list because enrollment is opening again soon. So just head over to www.iamfinallyfirst.com. Let's do this, ladies. It's time for you to put yourself first, one thought at a time. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week. 